Well, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I hope I've um, introduced myself to everybody. If I haven't, apologies, but I hope to get to know you all over the next few days. It's really a privilege to be here. And um, just thank you for the very lovely lunch, and I'll do you a deal. I'll stay awake if you stay awake. Because <laughs> that, uh, that lunch was a little bit too good. <laughs> So we've got some important and solemn truths to discuss, some old things and some new things. And um, yes, we, um, we just invite the Lord's presence to quicken our minds and our bodies so we can understand and give clarity. So I invite you to kneel with prayer, those that are able. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that we can meet here again this afternoon to uh, study the present truth message, the message that has been given to your people to not only awaken them, but to, uh, to, to take to the world, to, to show the world your love and your mercy and your compassion and your empathy and how you want to dwell with your people. And so we pray that all the heavenly blessings would be granted to us this afternoon, the promise of the Holy Spirit to quicken our minds, to show us the things of Jesus, to show us the things that are to come, to convict us of sin and righteousness of judgment. We invite him to do all his appointed work. We invite the presence of your angels to waft away any darkness. And we just invite your presence, Lord, that through your sanctifying work, we may be prepared to stand in your presence. So, Lord, enclose us in, be with uh, the little ones upstairs and uh, those that are looking after them as well and those that may be still um, travelling or, or working in preparation for the camp meeting. Please, Lord, bless all your people and we thank you and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There are two pages of notes in your handout that I'll be using. But I'm not sure if, if yours are like mine, they're out of order. So the first page should be timelines, which is page one and two. And then the second, there's a third and a fourth to follow. We'll be starting on the page that says timelines, not the page in front of it if there's one out of order. We're going to start by reading a quote from Testimonies, Volume 5, page 716, paragraph 2. It's on the top, under timelines. 5T716, paragraph 2. It says, While the Protestant world is by her attitude making concessions to Rome, let us arouse to comprehend the situation and view the contest before us in its true bearings. Let the watchmen now lift up their voice and give the message which is present truth for this time. Let us show the people where we are in prophetic history and seek to arouse the spirit of true Protestantism, awaking the world to a sense of the value of the privileges of religious liberty so long enjoyed. There's many things we can pull from this paragraph. Uh, the one, I guess, that I want to... Um, the theme of the study that we'll, I'll be sharing these next couple of days is that we are to show people where they are in prophetic history, which means we can know where we are in prophetic history. If we don't know where we are, what do we call that? What does it mean to, be, to not know where you are? Darkness. Yeah, you're in darkness. I heard the word. You're lost. If you don't know where you are, you're lost. Yes. You know, when you think of the parable, in a parable world, you have a sheep that is, he doesn't know where he is. And if you don't know where you are, you're lost. And um, it is salvational to know where you are in prophetic history, where it's required of us. 
My background, just quickly, is um, my husband and I came into Adventism when uh, in our early 20s, which was like so many years ago. <laughs> and um, I come from a very strong, long line of um, good Irish Roman Catholics. My husband comes from a very strong, pious Lutheran family. And we know what it is to be in darkness, to, to not know where you are. And I was concerned for my children at, a, at their young age uh, because they were being brought up Adventists. And Adventists grow up understanding the pan panorama of the great controversy. It's innate. They actually know where they are. I know what it's like to be lost. Got no idea. I was talking about this uh, with a friend uh, who's just coming into Adventism. She's uh, uh, only... She's not baptised, but she's just coming in. And she was sharing with me her understanding of what it means to be lost. And there's some very um, confronting uh, music and, um, uh, I guess, the, the world is really suffering from depression. <laughs> and she was sharing with me a, a particular... Uh, current pop song uh, that this was doing the rounds and it was uh, the pop music the music video you know how they do music videos was actually a cartoon by a very well-known cartoonist who does uh, touches on uh, political questions and it's of all this masses of people walking around with a cell phone and they're just staring at their cell phone you know they're just going like this and the, and the lyrics are, are you lost in the world like me? If the system has failed, are you free? And, it, and it's just the most depressing music <laughs> and video to watch. But you know what? You, it's worth watching because that's the world crying out. The, in that video, a, a young woman commits suicide and there they are, those masses of people just watching it on their phone. Um, and there's just, just this lone uh, boy walking through the clouds, uh, crowds just totally lost. And I kind of know what that is. And when you come into Adventism and they, they show you where you are, it's just the most wonderful thing. So I just, I'll just share with you quickly. We came in through a Daniel and Revelation seminar. And this was handed to us as we walked in the door. And you can see it's been around for a little while. <laughs> but that was the biggest light bulb moment in my life. Because I, it gave me a perspective. And all we were taught, good old-fashioned Adventism, was Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Rome broke up into the countries of Europe, and then Jesus comes. And we look at that now, today, in this room, and think, wow, that's a lot of history it's missed. Because if you go from the second Advent back to, back to when Europe was broken up, that's about 1,500 years. So there's a major gap in that teaching. But for me at that time, that's all I needed. I didn't care. That gave me a perspective that I never had. The thing is, the closer you get to an event, the more detail you see. So today, understanding that Rome broke up into the ten tribes of Europe doesn't cut it anymore. We need to know where we are in prophetic history and we're not back there and we're not at the second advent. So we, there has to be more to this message than what Adventism is currently teaching. And God is raising a remnant to do that. And I think one of the, the, uh, this passage gives us quite a few clues. It says, while the Protestant world is by her attitude making concessions to, Ro to Rome, what should we do? We should arouse, which means we've been asleep. <laughs> so it's this, the we're to watch the Protestant world. Because the what Protestant world has an attitude. What does your understanding of the word attitude? Any suggestions? Attendance. Pardon? Attendance. Okay. It, it's got a modern um, application, hasn't it? If we, if we say a child or somebody's got attitude, it's not a good thing, is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the way they speak, they're uncooperative, they're um, resentful, antagonistic. But that's a modern application of that word. 
So when we look at these passages, we need to know, well, what did Sister White mean by this word? So where do we go? Go to Noah Webster's dictionary. <laughs> go to those old dictionaries. What did she mean by the word attitude? And if you look up that word attitude, it is something that um, if, if you're sitting for a portrait or if somebody's making a statue of you or painting you, you would presume an attitude. So it's somebody is making a figure or a stature or a representation of you and you are standing a particular way or like lying or looking, you know, you're posing. So like an attitude is like a pose because somebody is making a figure of you. What's another word of a figure? Statue. An image. An image. So while the Protestant world is making an image or making concessions to Rome, this is what wakes us up. We should wake up to understand the situation, comprehend it, and view the contest before us. So there's a contest going on. So we've got to view that. There's a war, and we've got to understand that war and view it, which means we've got to be looking at that war. While men have slept, Satan has been stealthily sowing the tares. So, and then she says, let the watchmen now lift up their voice like a trumpet. So we wake up. We lift up our voice and we give the message which is present truth for this time, which means showing the people where they are in prophetic history. So understanding where you are in prophetic history is very much connected to what Protestantism is doing. We're to watch Protestantism. And that's the key to show us where we are. And, the, and what we'll, it will do is it will arouse the spirit of true Protestantism. So if there's a, there's a Protestantism that is, by her attitude, making concessions to Rome, we know that is false Protestantism. On the other hand, we will have true Protestantism. And that true Protestantism is awoken within the world. We awake the world to a sense of the values, the privileges of religious liberty. So somewhere in us being lost and not knowing where we are, and um, being asleep, we've lost the sense of true Protestantism. So where are we in prophetic history? How precise can we get? This week we want to be looking at the difference between true and false Protestantism, how we can understand Protestantism, and also um, how precise watching them can, uh, how, how precise we can be in knowing where we are. The closer we get to something, the more detail we see. That's just, that's just nature. You know, you, you're 100 miles from a city, you might see an outline if you're on top of a hill. The closer you get, you see more details of the building. You get even closer, you see windows and laneways and things like that so the closer we get the more detail and we saw that this morning brother james was laid, laid out the line of um the prophecy of enoch uh what was enoch's prophecy it was through his son methuselah when he dies it shall come got no idea what it was is and got no idea when <laughs> But the closer we got to that event, then you had somebody like Noah who was able to tell you what the it is and you were able to find out the when. And we should be able to do the same. What is it that we're to be watching and when is it going to happen? Whatever it is, it's connected to an understanding of true and false Protestantism. So in studying prophecy, uh, we, I'm sure we're all aware, we have to follow rules. So we're just going to start by looking at a couple of our rules. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 46 and 47. And that was another eye-opener for me, is that, you know, with every wind of doctrine blowing, how can you be sure what you believe is true? If you follow the rules, you can't go wrong. So 1 Corinthians 15, 46 and 47. It says, How be it that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward 
that which is spiritual. Sorry, 1 Corinthians 15, 46 and 47. So one of, the, one of the most important rules is understanding that what comes first, a natural understanding, a literal understanding, and, and this is important to understand parables. When Jesus spoke in parables, you had to understand the literal or natural first and then you could make a spiritual application. And then Paul goes on to say, the first man is of the earth, earthy, the second man is the Lord from heaven. So he's talking about Adam. First, literal Adam. Second, spiritual Adam, Christ. And, we, and then we compare the two. So I just want you to keep in that mind because that rule is going to be important as we go through. And then the second rule I want to look at is back in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians 14. And we'll read verses 32 and 33. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. What does that mean? Verse 32 and 33. 1 Corinthians 14, 32 and 33. The spirits of the prophets are subject to one another. What's the, what's the prophet's spirit? The spirit of God is a good spirit. It's a good spirit. It's the spirit of God speaking through them. So... So they all agree. So the spirit that's speaking through one is spirit, the, the same spirit that's speaking through another. So Noah has to agree with Jeremiah, who has to agree with John the Revelator, who has to agree with John the Baptizer. They, every prophet agrees. Because why? It's the same spirit. God is not the author of confusion. God doesn't, is not the author of confusion. So let's just make a little bit If God is not the author of confusion, what is the, he the author of? Truth. What does the text Order. say? He's the author of peace. As in all the churches of the world, of the saints. So what's the church of the saints that is authored by peace? What's the church in the Bible that is related to peace? No. Um, so it says... For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. Do you author a church? What do you do to a church? You build it. You build a church. So we could actually swap the word author for, you can see the word, the word author is supplied. We could say build. For God is not the author of confusion or the builder of confusion. What's the church that is builded on peace? Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They that prosper shall love thee. Peace be within thy walls and thy palaces. What does Jerusalem mean? City of peace. City of peace. God is not the author of confusion but of Peace, as in all the churches of the saints. The church of the saints is Jerusalem, the mountain of God. So if God is not the author of confusion, who is? Satan is the author of? And what's, what is built on confusion? Babylon. The builder of Babylon. Jerusalem, 
So, what was our first rule? First literal, natural, then spiritual. So today, do we consider literal Babylon? No. So should we consider literal Jerusalem? So today, this is mystery Babylon, and this is spiritual Jerusalem. So um, that's why we, we looked at that rule first, because as we compare Jerusalem and Babylon, we need to understand first literal then spiritual. So would anybody like to give a name for what we've just done when it comes to uh, prophetic understanding and rules? What do we call what I've just done laid on the board here? Paralleling. Comparing, comparing, contrasting. That's it. And there's another word. Juxtapositioning. What we've done is we've taken two concepts and like brought them up alongside each other and we're comparing and contrasting and here the, the contrast is obvious isn't it and we can call this a polar opposite and there's much to be learnt from polar opposites God does a lot of this because the meaning of a polar opposite is when you understand the essence of one you immediately understand the essence of the other I guess it's like the way I picture it in my mind is you know when you take a photo negative, you know, in an old fashioned camera that actually had film and you saw the negative, the black was white and the white was black, but you could still make out the image. They were so alike and yet they're so different. Why is this so, so different? And why is it so alike? It's both. There's similarities and there's differences. Satan is a created being. So ha ha all he can do is counterfeit so his kingdom is a counterfeit of the truth that's all he can do so let, let's let's compare these thoughts further if we take babylon we're seventh day adventists so we're experts <coughs> in babylon um, because of the second angel's me message so let's go and have a look at the second angel's message revelation chapter 14 Revelation 14 verse 8 says, pardon me, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Babylon falls. So um, we read that God authors or builds Jerusalem. Now we're reading that well, Satan builds Babylon, but Babylon falls. So when does Babylon fall? Babylon falls, if, if we understand that these are polar opposites, when is Babylon going to fall? When Jerusalem is builded. Oh, I don't think we looked up that quote. Okay, go to Psalm 147.1. Psalm 147.1. Says, praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God, for it is pleasant and praise is comely. The Lord doth build up Jerusalem. He gathereth together the outcasts of Israel. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. I think that's a popular scripture song. So what does the Lord do? He builds up Jerusalem. What does it mean to build up Jerusalem according to that verse? So to build up Jerusalem means to gather. So when Jerusalem is built, it means the outcasts are gathered. And who are the outcasts? What's the next verse say? Those that are broken. Broken hearted. Broken in heart and uh, bind up in wounds. 
Yeah, so that, that, that they're the outcasts of Israel. Um, and he telleth the number of the stars. Who are the stars? Because he's gathering, he's gathering the outcasts. Where do we go to find out who the stars are? Daniel chapter 12. And the stars, according to Daniel 12, 3, are the, they that shine like the brightness of the firmament and there's the stars forever and ever. The teachers of Israel are the outcasts of Israel. Okay, let's go to Daniel 12. Um, well, Daniel 12.1 says, And at that time shall Michael stand up. What do we, we, do, we, what do we understand that verse to be? close of probation um, and that's when God's people are delivered those that are found in the book that's when the time of trouble begins and that's verse 2 says and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake verse 3 says and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever so the wise are those that turn people to righteousness and if you've got a good KJV with a marginal reference, what does it tell us the wise are? In verse 3, the wise shine as the brightness of the firmament. Anybody got a marginal reference? That word wise means teachers. They that be teachers shine, they're the stars. So it's the stars that are gathered. They're the, the outcasts of Israel. If you bring all these texts together. They shine as the brightness of the firmament. They turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So it's these outcasts of Israel that are gathered that build up Jerusalem at the same time what is happening to Babylon. Fallen. It's fallen. So we lay these things on top of each other and they give us more information. If Babylon is fallen, Jerusalem is builded. And what is Jerusalem builded of? Outcasts, teachers, stars. You bring all those, that information together. Those that are broken in heart. Those that need their wounds binding. So, um, okay, so we went to Revelation chapter 14, verse 8. And it said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. And Jerusalem is also that great city. Uh, so let's go to um, let's go to Revelation sixteen. Revelation sixteen verse nineteen. And that great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So great city, great Babylon is divided into how many parts? Three. And how do, where do we go now to find out what those three parts are? What are the three parts of Babylon? Same chapter, yep. verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and of the beast and the false prophet. So Babylon is made up of three parts. A dragon, a beast, and a false prophet. 13. Why is Great Babylon made up of three parts? What is Satan trying to build? Thank you. So let's go to Isaiah 14 and we'll read that just to uh, confirm. Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah 14. And we'll start at verse 12. Isaiah 14, 12. 
How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. I'm going to be like God. How is Satan going to be like God? Well, whoever God is, he has a throne above the stars. Of, above the stars. So who sits on a throne? Who sits on a throne? A king. A king. He has a congregation. What kind of entity has a congregation? Does, a, does government have a congregation? Yes. It's, not a, it's not a word I'd associate with government. You'd have to go to a church to get a congregation, wouldn't you? So it, it ha, it, to have a congregation, you have to have a church. And then also he said, I'm going to ascend above the heights of the clouds. What kind of, um, what kind of being ascends above the heights of the clouds? We're flesh. Angels. Angels are what? Spiritual. Ministering yes. spirits. You've got to be spirit to ascend above the heights of the clouds. We're flesh. Can we ascend? No, we're stuck here, nice and firm on the ground. But you're spirit. So you've got to be spirit. And what we've got here, and, in it, and then he says, I will be like the most high. Because what he is doing is he's counterfeiting the... Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in order to, to counterfeit it, that, that's why he has developed these three entities, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, a kingly power, a churchly power, and a spirit power. Um, and we would say that this is the threefold enemy of God's people. So what does that make the Godhead? We're comparing and contrasting. If this is the threefold enemy, then this is the threefold, throw out a word. What's the opposite of enemy? Friend? Ally? What's an ally? Somebody who goes in, go on. Yeah, yeah. Somebody there that to help you to, um, who's on your side, he's your friend. And um, so we can see even this is um, just, 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 as a, uh, uh, just to show you how this works. If you go to Revelation chapter 13, understanding that it, Satan's kingdom is a polar opposite can really open up a lot of light on how the Godhead interacts. Uh, we don't, I don't want to spend too much time of this, but even if you look at um, Revelation chapter 13, um, verses 1 and 2, uh, John the Revelator says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten, uh, ten horns, etc. And we understand that first beast of Revelation 13 to be the papacy. But something is given to the papacy. What is given to the papacy? Power, see, great authority by whom? Dragon. So you can go into the... This is, this is the book of Revelation that is written by John the Revelator. But if you go to the Gospel of John... The Gospel of John is going to tell you just how the Father gave the Son power, seat, great authority. And all those verses are right there and from about John 13 and onwards. The Father gave the Son authority to execute judgment. And all power was given to him from the Father. He was also given a seat. He was given a throne. So everything that the dragon gives to the beast is a counterfeit of what the father has given to the son. And then we can go on and understand that how the Holy Spirit is used in this confederacy. Is a confederacy a good thing or a bad thing? Depends. This is an evil confederacy. But this is the true confederacy. They're confederating to bring about the plan of salvation. 
So, it, it, again, polar opposites. So that's just something that you might look like to look into in your own time. Compare what John the Revelator in Revelation is sharing with us about the dragon beast and false prophet and then go to what John the Gospel writer is sharing with us about the Godhead. So um, when we look at these, the dynamics between the dragon, the beast and the false prophet, actually, okay, let, let's take that a bit further. This is the threefold enemy of God. And I'm sure some of you have seen this done before, but we can go back into history and we can find, well, where has there been a threefold confederacy in the past that has um, tried to bring down God's people? And the first place we usually go to is the history of Elijah. Because Elijah had to come up against a threefold confederacy. Who did he have to, who was his enemies? Ahab, Jezebel, and the false prophets. Who hated Elijah? Who wanted him dead? Did Ahab want him dead? He would have been happy if he just had to shut up to keep his woman off his back. But he wasn't that, you know, he, he actually listened to Elijah. But Jezebel hated Elijah. Why? What was Elijah saying? Unholy relationship. Should Ahab have been married to Jezebel? And that was Elijah's message. Got him into a whole heap of trouble. So Jezebel, she's just a woman. Has she got the power, the seed or the authority? Has she, has she got any power at all to kill Elijah? Well, who does she need to kill Elijah? So what's she got to do? She's got to use a deceiving power to work on the kingly power to kill Elijah. So that's the dynamics. There's a second Elijah in history. Who's that? John the Baptist. What threefold union does he face? Herod. Herodias. Salome. Who hated John the Baptist? Herodias. Why? You can't marry your brother's wife. Unholy relationship. Did Herod want John the Baptist dead? No, but he would have been happy if he had to shut up to keep his wife off his back. So what's Herodias got to do? She's just a woman. She's got to deceive the king power to do her will. And so she uses a deceiving power. So these are all compare and contrasts. We see similarities. We see differences. What's the difference, the glaring difference between the two stories? Yeah, there's quite some hundred years difference. Mm -hmm. So did Jezebel succeed? No. no, Elijah was translated without seeing death. So he would represent who? 144,000. John the Baptist. Did Herodias succeed? Yes. Yes, so we would represent the yes. martyrs. But they both represent God's people at the end of the world that um, face this threefold enemy. And again, if you look at the relationship between Ahaz and Jezebel and the false prophets, and again down here as well, it is a direct counterfeit of how the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit work together, but in a positive way. So that's um, our compare and contrast. So what, the, what Jezebel and Herodias needed was an ally, was somebody who could w work on their behalf. And this is where Protestantism is going to come in. We need to understand the dynamics between the three. What we also need to under, want to understand is when. So we want to understand um, uh, how Protestantism is going to work at the end of the world and, uh, and when. 
So when we come down to the end of the world, we're going to see a kingly power, a church power, and a deceiving power. And we want to understand where Protestantism fits into that threefold union. So we'll look at that a bit further. First of all, let's go to Matthew 24, verse 3. We're going to look at the deceiving power. We want to, false, the false prophets, or I should say prophets of Baal, that's what I should have written. So, um, where are we going? Matthew 24. Because the disciples wanted to know when. So we go to Matthew 24 and we'll jump in at verse 3. And as he, Jesus, sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So what was it in particular they wanted to know what when something was going to happen. What was the thing that they were wondering when was going to happen? End of the world, but what was the catalyst that got them asking that question in the first place? Because what did Jesus said, had just say? He was talking about the destruction of the temple of Israel. Jerusalem, God had built up Jerusalem and now it's sounding like God's going to destroy Jerusalem. Jerusalem's going to fall. So if that's going to, what, going to happen, then it must be the end of the world. So when is these things going to ha happen? And what's the first thing that Jesus is going to say to them in verses 4 and 5? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So the very first thing that he's going to slam them with, is he's going to try and drill into their minds, is that you could be deceived. Matthew 24, 3 and 4. Take heed because deception is very real. And when we look at our threefold union here, who does the deceiving? The prophets of Baal and Salome. And what did Jesus say that these deceiving powers would do? They would come in his name. What's his name? They would be Christian. So the most deceiving power that we have to be wary of will be, uh, will call itself Christian. So we, what, what, what we learn from the prophets of Baal, what we learn from Salome, uh, should give us more information about this deceiving Christian uh, entity. I'm sorry, James, I, I haven't got a watch. Are you able to just... Ten minutes, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we want to look into history. Obviously, when we, we, we're, we will know where we are in history when we can identify this Christian entity, entity that is out to deceive us. So how, and how precise can we be with that? And um, I'm just wondering if that might be a good place to stop before we start the next section of, of what I'm about to do because I don't really want to break that up. So if that's okay, we'll take, I think we're all a bit tired anyway, uh, have, a, have a, a, a walk and a bit of fresh air and then we'll come, out, come back and continue this thought. So just in, um, uh, in um, re reviewing what we did, what we've um, looked at is how juxtapositioning can work and giving us a lot of information about how the great controversy is going to look at the end of the world. We see that Satan's plan is a direct counterfeit of what God has set up for our salvation. God does not want us to be lost. He wants us to know exactly where we are. In knowing exactly where we are is very um, much connected to our salvation. Wasn't it? 
the, you know, the, 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 the parable of the lost sheep means he had to be found. Once he's found, somebody knows where that sheep is. So um, we compared uh, how God builds Jerusalem, Satan builds Babylon. But what we want to also show is that when Babylon falls, Jerusalem gets built. So we should be looking to see when the second angel's message comes into history. And then we should be able to see that relationship between the threefold makeup of Babylon, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And then we want to go into these, that false prophet and look more closely at how the prophets of Baal and Salome worked, how that's going to be illustrated by a Christian entity at the end of the world. And that's the first thing that Christ has warned us about is that we will be, uh, there's the possibility of us being deceived by that Christian entity. So this is what I thought, I don't know if you I may be corrected. So like you have told us, there was a literal Jerusalem. The real Jerusalem there in Israel. And there was a literal Babylon down here in Iraq, for example. There was a real Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. So, and then I think when we see those literal nations, then we can see now in Revelation chapter 12 and chapter 17, you can contrast the spirit of Babylon. 12 is the church of God, and 17 is the Babylon, the mystery, the mat of Harald's. So, if that's how I look at it, I don't know. If there's a mystery Babylon, then there's a mystery Jerusalem. They're polar opposites. If it's spiritual Babylon, it has to be spiritual Jerusalem. Of course, there's so, spiritual yeah. Jerusalem, spiritual Babylon. Yes, and what does it mean to be a mystery? We might look at that next. Well, the, the mysteries of the New Testament are the secrets of the Old Testament. A mystery and a secret are the same thing. So when you go into the Old Testament, it will talk about secrets. In the, the book of Daniel, um, uh, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his, and he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings instead of... He revealeth the deep and the secret things. <laughs> I've got to sing through the... <laughs> Scripture song to get to the bit. God reveals the secret things. What are the secret things? Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets under his servants, the prophets. What secrets do the prophets have? Prophecies. Secrets of prophecies. The secrets of the Old Testament are the mysteries of the New Testament. There's no word secret in the Greek. It's mystery. So secret in the Old, mystery in the New. So when you talk about something being mystery, it's just prophetic. So we've got prophetic Jerusalem, prophetic Babylon. It's mystery. God never designed that mysteries weren't meant to be understood. No more than we're, we're, we're meant to understand prophecy. We're meant to understand mysteries. But a mystery is something you've, you know, people watch mystery murders, don't they? Because you've got you to watch carefully for clues and work out who done it. <laughs> Same thing. It, it, it's, 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 a, it's a mystery, but only because we've got to go searching and, and it's just not obvious. The mystery, the mystery that I know about in the New Testament, Paul is talking about like the mystery which was hidden from ages past, which is Christ Jesus in you. So the, the mystery of God really is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So once Jesus is revealed, then that's the mystery. And that's all connected with prophecy. Yeah. And therefore, when you look at the Revelation chapter 10, some verse down there, I don't know, verse, around verse 8, it says, when the seventh angel is about to sound the, 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 the seventh the trumpet, the mystery of God shall have, shall have ended. Yes. So when you look all into those things, the mystery of God in reality is Jesus Christ in us. Once we understand what was hidden in the Old Testament, like you have said, which is all about Jesus Christ, once we understand about that, then we know what's going on. And how do we get, in a parable world, how do we get Jesus in us? How does that happen? How, we, how were the Millerites told to do it in Revelation chapter 10? How did they get Jesus in them? Revelation chapter 10. They had to eat him. You had to eat that little book. You had to eat that prophetic message. And that's the mystery. 
It's a mystery how we eat lunch today and we absorb it and all those nutrients goes into every cell of our body and we actually live and function and breathe. The, the, the it's tablet, the same, that's the literal, yeah, same with the spiritual. Yeah, they studied, they understood, so the, after eating, the message was so sweet, but they were disappointed and it was bitter. So, yeah. so on that note, like we could just close with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you've granted us insight into this wonderful plan of salvation. We just want to cooperate with you in every way. We want to eat that little book. We want Christ to um, live out his life within us. We, we want to live and breathe every part of your message, that we can be these stars that shine as bright as the firmament, that bring turn many to righteousness. So uh, be with us now as we, we uh, take a little rest and... Um, and may our minds be cleared for the rest of the afternoon. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.